Good morning, everyone. Why no stairs? <laughs> Buenos dias. <laughs> I'd like to call all the men of God up to front. Hello. Come on up. Bill wasn't here. You need to tell him what's happening. Bill, we have the men come up for prayer to stand in the gap. If you want to. If you want to. Thank you, man. We're <laughs> good to see you up here standing in the gap for us. <coughs> I'm going to have uh, Jerry lead us in prayer this morning. Well, Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, the name above all names, and we thank you for this day that you have made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And Lord, we just ask that you have your way. Help us to stay out of your way and Holy Spirit just move amongst the people and you know the needs and you know need, you know what to do and we just thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Okay, praise the Lord. In all things, amen. Don't you know it's time to praise the Lord in the sanctuary of His Holy Spirit. So set your mind on Him and let your praise begin. In the glory of the Lord will fill this place. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, he lives within the praises of his people, he waits to hear us call upon his name, so let your mind on him and let your praise begin. And the glory of the Lord will fill this place. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Once more, here we go. Don't you know it's time to praise the Lord? In the sanctuary of His Holy Spirit. So set your mind on Him. And let your praise begin, and the glory of the Lord will fill this place. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. He lives within the praises of his people. He waits to hear us call upon his name. So set your mind on him and let your praise begin and the glory of the Lord will fill this place. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Don't you know it's time to praise the Lord? Yeah, that's your invitation. It's time. Come on, now is the time to worship. Come on. Now is the time to give your heart. Come, just as you are to worship. Come, just as you are before your God. Come. 
One day every tongue will confess you are God. One day every knee will bow. Still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. Oh, now is the time to worship. Come, on. now is the time to give your heart. Come, on. just as you are to worship. Come, on. just as you are before your God. Come. On. One day every tongue will confess you are God. One day every knee will bow. Still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. One day every tongue will confess you are God. One day every knee will bow. Still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now Come on. Now is the time to worship Come on. Now is the time to give your heart Come on. Now is the time to worship. Humble yourself in worship in the sight of the Lord. Come before him with joyful singing. God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Humble yourself in the mighty presence of the Lord. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. For he shall live you are higher and higher and he shall live you are. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. And he shall lift you up higher and higher. Thyself in the sight of the Lord. I'm doing the echo. <laughs> and he shall lead you all higher and higher, and he shall lead. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. And he shall live you up higher and higher, and he shall live. You are humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. 
and he shall lift you up higher and higher. He shall lift you up, and he shall lift you up. And he shall live you all. It's a promise right out of the word of God. More love, more power, more of you in my life. More love, more power, more of you in my life. And I will worship you with all of my heart. And I will worship you with all of my mind. And I will worship you with all of my strength. For you are my Lord. More love, more power, more of you in my life. More love, more power, more of you in my life. And I will seek your face with all of my heart. And I will seek your face with all of my mind. And I will seek your face with all of my strength, for you are my Lord. More love, more power, more of you in my life. More love, more power, more of you in my life. And I will worship you with all of my heart. And I will worship you with all of my mind. I will worship you with all of my strength. For you are my Lord. More love, more power, more of you in my life. More love, more power, more of you in my life. More love, more power, more of you in my life. We thank you, Christ our Lord for that great exchange upon the cross when you exchanged your righteousness for our filthy rags so that we might be called the righteousness of God in Christ that's our position now God's very righteousness because we are in Christ what a, what a blessed reality that is. Whiter than snow, you have made me holy in the Father's eyes. You see in me the child you died for, and you see in me the one you love I've been redeemed I've been redeemed bought with a price and ransomed from my 
back to life as it were. Once we were sinners, lost, dead in our sins and trespasses. But Christ, through his blood, has redeemed us. There's no greater joy in the universe. We approach your throne tried of heart crying out to you in repentance overwhelm us now in your holiness reignite the flame within us. We seek cleansing and forgiveness for our hearts that turn away. Restore us to the place where we desire own. Desire only you. Fill our hearts, O oh Lord, with your righteousness. Renew in us the joy of salvation. Us 
us now in your holiness reignite the flame within us we seek cleansing and forgiveness for our hearts they turn away restore us to the place where we desire only you desire turn away restore us to the place where we desire only you desire only you desire only you desire Father, we desire you. It's true, Father, our hearts turn away daily into our own ways, into the ways of the world, and we repent before you. We thank you that you've given us the ability to repent and to come to you, and that you continually turn our sins from scarlet to white as snow. And we are so thankful. We are so, so thankful that you are continuing to sanctify us daily, we are continuously being conformed to the image of Christ Jesus. And this is all you're doing. And we are so grateful. We are so thankful. Lord, be exalted today in the midst of your people. Help us to worship you unrestricted all through the day and even into the night visions that we would hear your voice. We love you. In Jesus' name they all said, Amen. Amen. Take time to fellowship with one another. Okay, uh, I refurbished the prayer tree, so everybody that is on our roster is now back up on the tree. Please take one, pray for them for a week, and bring the tag back, and take a different one. Thank you. Going through Acts, and uh, we were looking at what was going on in Philippi. We're going to continue doing that today. Uh, we're going to see how this progresses. It's quite an interesting story. It's, it's so amazing what God does there in Philippi. Now, we looked last week and we realized that the spiritual warfare that was going on in Philippi you know, it started covertly, you know, the dragon, the Satan, the great serpent, how, you know, whatever term you want to use, is always seeking to cause us to, to uh, you know, trust his voice or whatever, you know, just turn from God, you get the drift. And when that's not working, when we finally catch on to what's going on and we say, no, we're not going to serve you, we're not going to serve your uh, foolishness and the things of the world and our sinful nature. We're choosing to follow God. Oh, he says, okay then. And the next thing you notice is the beast rises. And we've studied all this in Revelation, so you should have a working knowledge of how this works now. The beast is Satan, don't get me wrong. I mean, he's part of this whole thing, right? But in the visions that John is having, he's seeing how all of this works. And what happens is the beast is the power of government. 
that can crush a population, but most specifically, it always goes after the people of God to crush the advancement of the gospel. And so that's what we're seeing. You know, we, we saw the slave girl situation, and she was, you know, yelling out, these men are, you know, uh, telling you the way of salvation. These are men of God, blah, blah, blah. And it was all distraction and all sorts of things going on. Paul finally got annoyed, and he said, that's enough. And he cast that demon out of the girl. Well, that caused a problem because her pimps were making money off of her clairvoyance. They call them spiritual pimps. And uh, that's even too nice for what these guys were. And, and so once that was removed, then we see the satanic, the demonic uh, movement going to, okay, then we'll just have the power of government crush you. And so then the mob forms, and that's where we're picking it up. There's a riot, and, and these guys are claiming, you know, oh, man, they stopped us from making our money, but that's not how you usually get a lot of people. They, they, they started with racism and bigotry. Because once you demonize somebody based on racist lines and bigotry, and like that, you can get them whooped up, and you can get them to hate people because they're different. Let's look and see what happened. The beast in the guise of governmental power provides cover for the illegal arrest and beating of Paul and Silas. Now, the unfounded accusations of the mob, as I just told you, they're not only false, but you're going to see they're also racist. The magistrates, the local civil leaders, beat Paul and Silas with rods as a warning to them to cease from proselytizing. Uh, so you see here there's a religious bigotry going on already popping up. They're jailed for the night, but they're going to be released the next day and just run out of town. That's how we're going to handle this problem. We'll take care of these Jews who are telling us all to worship different things and follow traditions and laws that are not Roman in origin. We'll get rid of these bad eggs. We'll move them out of our territory. Well, Paul and Silas have bleeding backs, and they're placed in the worst part of the dungeon. And their legs are placed in stocks. Instead of plotting revenge, though, and this is where it starts getting interesting. Instead of plotting revenge, Paul and Silas begin to pray and worship publicly to a captive audience. Pardon the pun. The rest of the inmates. What are they doing? They glorify God and they advance the kingdom in the midst of filth and depressing hopelessness. You know, you go to a prison, you know, in the United States, it's not a picnic. Trust me, you know that if you've ever been in one. I worked in one for a year. It's not a fun place to be. You really don't want to be there, okay? But it is not, that's a country club compared to the kind of prisons and dungeons and <clears throat> jails that you have in other countries, but especially back 2,000 years, I couldn't even imagine sitting down. <coughs> Excuse me. It'd be terrible. But here's the deal. Regardless of how unfair the situation was, regardless of the fact that they've been beaten with rods, in other words, they were caned. Maybe you know that term from from history, yet they are reporting for duty as expected. That's a lesson to all of us. We always need to be reporting for duty. We're in God's army. We wear his uniform. We're clothed in the armor of God. We're clothed in the light. We are clothed in Christ Jesus himself, as Paul says. We report for duty as expected, and it doesn't matter how bad the situation looks you still report for duty. This entire situation, though, has been orchestrated by God. That's why they report for duty. They know who's in control. As the evangelists worship within the bowels of the dungeon, God exhibits a sign, a sign or a wonder, depending on what term you prefer, to proclaim the power of the gospel. Now, this is a pattern we see in the book of Acts, and it's a pattern that goes throughout all of the ages, throughout the earth. 
When missionaries, evangelists, whatever term, witnesses, enter a pagan cult culture that's immersed in idolatry, a spiritual power encounter often takes place in which God steamrolls the local deities with a sign of power to confirm the authority of the evangelists and prepare the people's hearts for the preaching of the gospel. That's been going on for 2,000 years. Saw that in Mexico when we were doing mission work. Holy smokes. Just like in the book of Acts. The Philippian jailer witnesses the behavior of the innocent prisoners, and then he experiences the earthquake. And there's your sign, the earthquake. When rescued from his suicidal intention, you remember he draws his sword to kill himself, He's rescued from that by Paul saying, we're all here. And then what do we see him say? What must I do to be saved? This man's heart has been changed. He's seen something he can't understand. He's seen the power of God in these two men. He wants to know, I want to be like these guys. Now, upon believing in Christ, the jailer exhibits behavior associated with a regenerated heart or a born-again heart, and he joyfully ministers Christian kindness to the prisoners. And that's the, the passage we're going to be looking at. We're going to break it down in a minute. This passage, though, teaches us one thing. Well, lots of stuff. But the main thing, it's about faithfulness. Our faithfulness to the Great Commission and God's faithfulness, faithfulness to His obedient servants. When the gospel is preached, things happen. We cannot always predict the results or expect things to go our way. What's important is that things will go God's way, regardless of conditions, situations, because He's in charge. You see, He has triumphed over the enemy, and he is establishing his kingdom through his obedient church. That's you all. That's us. -ins. So let's look at the first point as we get into our text. Acts chapter 16, beginning with verse 22 is where we're going to pick it up. God selects a soil for the gospel. Now, the crowd joined in attacking them. That would be Paul and Silas. And the magistrates tore the garments off and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. Wow. I can't even imagine being thrown into the, the depths of the dungeon because, you know, that's where all the rat feces and everything is, right? With open sores on your back, blood coming out, sitting in that kind of an environment. Wow. Philippi's ground zero for the gospel. You see, God has chosen a soil in which the gospel of the kingdom is going to thrive. We've already explored how God chose Macedonia to advance the gospel into Europe. We've already covered that part. We saw the gospel bring light and life to Lydia and her family and her friends. We witnessed the mission team cast the demon out of the slave girl, thus eliminating her spiritual pimp's source of income. When the gospel is preached, things happen. Now, of course, this all results in mob violence against the evangelists. Spiritual warfare results when the gospel collides with the satanic bondage that's rooted in a culture's economic practices. Now, if you've been in the Sunday school class, we've been going through the minor prophets, we see that coming up in every one of those. The, the demonic economic practices mainly of the people of God, of either Judah or Israel, the northern kingdom. And God really gets upset 
with economic practices that oppress people. But you know that goes on, right? We see it all the time. But God doesn't like it. He deals with it. Richard Collier, who is the historian of the Salvation Army, provides insight to this spiritual cause and effect. Wherever the gospel goes, it's, it, 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 it collides with bad economic practices, among other things, with that culture, and then things explode, things happen. This was the Salvation Army, of course, in England. He says, persecution was great from the beginning. Gangs frequently hurled mud and stones through the windows at the preaching and the crowd. The liquor dealers, there's your economics, the liquor dealers worked hard to have Booth kicked out of East London. The police were no help. In fact, they often broke up outdoor meetings and accused Booth's followers of being the cause of all the trouble. That's what we're seeing in Philippi. It's the same stuff. Beatings were not uncommon. In 1889, at least, 669 Salvation Army members were assaulted. Some were killed, and many were maimed. Even children were not immune. Ruffians threw lime in the eyes of a child of a Salvation Army member. The newspapers ridiculed Booth. Punch, which was a very influential British satire magazine at the time, referred to Booth as Field Marshal Von Booth. It's not pleasant when you've got the media against you. But to lighten things up, do you remember my friend that works for the Salvation Army? Not ringing any bells? I thought we'd take a break from the real tough stuff. <laughs> Philippi's mob violence, of course, began with economics. It was an economic issue that, ticked, that started it off, that lit the fuse. But the accusations immediately took on a racist and bigoted attitude. In Acts 16, 20 through 21, which we were into last week, the mission team, listen how it's put it, is branded as Jews and instigators of anti-Roman laws and customs. The mob was utilizing the government's, the Roman government's, discouragement regarding proselytizing of Roman citizens. They used that as an indictment against the evangelists. Now, Rome didn't really push that whole thing. They just didn't smile on it. They frowned on you trying to evangelize Roman citizens into different religions. But they usually just kind of ignored it. Well, the mob knew that that was there, though, and so they took advantage of it and started whipping people up, getting them frenzied, getting them excited. And this is always the case an enemy must be demonized in order to whip up and maintain the required hatred to persecute them. Now, what I find ironic is that the lawbreakers in a situation here are not the evangelists, but it's the mob and the magistrates. They employ racism, false accusation, and violence against... Two Roman citizens, Paul and Silas. Now Luke and Timothy are not swept up into the false charges as they were Gentiles. Well, that emphasizes the racist mentality of the mob. So the question always arises, you may be thinking this because you've read through Acts before. Why did Paul and Silas not claim their Roman citizenship at this point and save themselves from a beating and imprisonment? Good question. Well, it may be that for Paul to declare Roman citizenship when the connections to Judaism are part of the mob's complaint, that just might send a message that Paul's cultural and religious loyalties to Rome were suspect. At any rate, Paul seemed to know when it was appropriate to play his citizenship card. He didn't hear, but he will. But he went through the beating, he went through the imprisonment, so that no one could say, oh, you know, these guys, 
they might be Roman citizens, but they're truly Jews, they're truly instigators. No, no, and pull all that together and feel justified in persecuting him. Paul seemed to know when it was time and when it wasn't. These magistrates were known in Latin as lictores, which means rod bearers. And that's where we get the expression, getting your licks. Getting your licks in. That's what they did. They had bundles of rods. And that was their, that was their title, the lectores. And they would smack you with these, these rods. It's called a caning. And it would, of course, leave all sorts of marks and that, this, that, and the other. These rods were a symbol of Roman justice. Now, you say, well, why didn't they whip them? Like with the cat of nine tails? Because that was reserved for severe punishment. This, the caning was a bit milder. Well, I wouldn't want to go through it. But it was a bit milder just to warn you that you keep this up and we're going to escalate the punishment. So they got whooped with these canes, these, these bundles of rods, and then thrown into the prison. See, the magistrates listened to the false accusations against Paul and Silas, had them caned without inquiry or trial, jailed them overnight, and planned to expel them from Philippi the next day. We'll teach these boys a lesson. They ain't from around here. We'll take care of them. What we see happening in Philippi has been replicated globally throughout history. The gospel divides. And you need to know that. Going in, the gospel divides. It divides relationships. It divides communities, even nations. And guess what? It's supposed to divide. It divides light from darkness, sheep from goats, and even the thoughts and intentions of the human heart. Wherever the gospel goes, it incites fleshly reaction. Too many Christians think taking the gospel somewhere is like, coming with a valentine. We just want to love you. That's not how it's received because the gospel intentionally divides. You have to choose. You're going to listen to God or you're going to listen to darkness. Which is it? Violence against the messenger of the gospel is often perpetrated. So, should we neglect our Christian duty out of fear? Should we go along with the world so that we might get along? Well, I know you know the correct answer to that question. I'll just leave that with you. Ignatius, the second bishop of Antioch, was arrested when he refused, this is at the end of the first century, when he refused to acknowledge the official gods of the Roman Empire. Not being a Roman citizen like Paul and Silas were. Ignatius, Bishop Ignatius, was sentenced to die in Rome's amphitheater. Like Stephen, the first martyr, Ignatius knew that he would soon be with his Lord, eliminating any fear of his impending death. I want you to note as I read this quote from him how much he sounds like the Apostle Paul. He says, Now I begin to be a disciple of Christ. I care for nothing of visible or invisible things so that I may but win Christ. Let fire and the cross, let the companies of wild beasts, let breaking of bones and tearing of limbs, let the grinding of the whole body and all the malice of the devil come upon me. Be it so. Only. May I win Jesus Christ. Wow. Tertullian, one of the early church fathers of the second century, coined the term, and you've heard it before, the blood of martyrs is the seed of the church. In his literary work, Apologeticus, Tertullian derive, drives this point home by directly addressing it to the Roman Empire. 
that's going to get noticed. You're going to get a reaction. He says, We are not a new philosophy, but a divine revelation. That's why you can't just exterminate us. The more you kill, the more we are. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Now you praise those who endured pain and death, so long as they aren't Christians. Your cruelties merely prove our innocence of the crimes that you charge against us, and you frustrate your own purpose, because those who see us die wonder why we do. For we die like the men you revere, like heroes, not like the slaves or criminals. And when they find out, they join us. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Well, that's an interesting historical marker. Could something like this that we just described happen in today's world? That's satire, by the way. It seems impossible to us. But look at what's happening in real time. Today, look at the headlines. The Taliban have taken Afghanistan upon our departure, just as the communists did in South Vietnam. With Sharia law in place, the lives of Christians in Afghanistan are threatened. Persecution and death are very real to these believers. Other Afghan minorities are being killed as I write this. The Islamic Taliban worship a false god. They worship a god of their own making. Their god is vindictive and lacking love and grace. Consequently, death to infidels is their evangelistic doctrine. Could these things happen today? The answer is obviously yes. They are happening. Now, you got this stuff going on all over the Middle East, but you also have it going on, going on down in Africa. Persecution in Ethiopia has intensified in the last few years, especially against those who faithfully proclaim the gospel, plant churches, and train biblical disciples. One believer, a man named Dereje, has been specifically targeted for his work in southern Ethiopia, where his faithful witness and the power of the gospel are viewed as threats. In 2016, Dereje said some Muslims in the region grew angry about the number of Muslims that were coming to faith in Jesus Christ. And the following year, rioting Muslims attacked, beating and killing some Christians and destroying more than 2,000 homes and more than two dozen churches. Derge was among those that were targeted. During the last month of the attacks, as an attack on their village was imminent, Derge gathered some believers and encouraged them with a message from Psalm 23. Man, this is preaching under fire. This is amazing. He says, by the time I finished sharing the word, he recalled, the attacks had started. I heard people getting beaten, and I saw flames from burning homes. So I ran home as quickly as I could to protect my family. When the attackers arrived at my house, they called me by name. They were saying, Derge, Derge, come out. This is your day, and you won't escape. This is recent stuff. When Derje learned that he was one of the attacker's main targets and that they would not stop until they had killed him, he fled with his family to another town. They traveled on foot for five days and slept in the jungle before finally reaching safety. Derje and his family eventually resettled in a different area where he resumed his ministry leading Muslims and others to Christ. He has returned to the site of the attacks twice since 2017, and he said he's willing to serve there again if God calls him to do so. 
Derejay and other Ethiopian Christians like him continued to witness boldly for Christ, willingly facing the consequences. He says this, There is only one mighty one, the one who sent us. If we die, we are going to him. But just trust the Lord, do not be afraid. Fear is a disease. If you fear, you cannot walk even one step. The one who is with you is greater than fear. Don't be afraid. Trust the Lord. Fear is a disease. In our culture, it all seems so first century. But stop and look at what's happening here. It is fast becoming illegal to speak against the sexual revolution and those who promote it. If it is illegal, which is what they continue to work on, then it is a crime. Criminals can be prosecuted, fined, and jailed. Can this stuff that we're reading about happen here? Of course. In our culture, the left worships the creature rather than the creator. Their gods are many, Mother Earth, sexual deviancy, materialism, and of course the human being. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Even so, the advance of the gospel will not be stopped. Our second point is that God tills, He not only selects the soil for the gospel, He tills the soil for the gospel. He prepares it. Let's start with verse 25. About midnight. Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundation of the prison was shaken. And immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bonds were unfastened. It means they came out from the wall. Okay, they were bolted into the wall. They came out. Ping, ching, whoa, we're free. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, He drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul, with a loud voice, cried out, saying, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. Now that's a miracle in itself. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in. And trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Whoa, many wondrous things are occurring in Philippi. God is tilling the soil in preparation for the gospel to flourish. We see Paul and Silas faithfully glorify God in difficult surroundings. They're singing hymns, and they're praying loud enough so that all the other inmates, including the jailer, can hear them glorifying God while they're bleeding in rat-infested environments. Man, didn't teach us that in mission class. We see an earthquake as a picture of God's power right here to set the captives free. Are you picking up on this? Are you seeing what's going on? We are also about to meet the individual for whom all of this has been orchestrated. And that would be the Philippian jailer. See, he joins the list of those whom God chose to influence their communities with the gospel. Like the Samaritan woman at the well. Remember that divine appointment with Jesus, John 4? What about that God-fearing Gentile, Lydia? And now we have the pagan jailer. He is also about to experience a divine appointment with God. God's doing all this to get this guy. And this guy is going to influence his community. God knows what he's doing. We might question it, but God's always in charge, and he's always right. 
Now, let's think about Paul and Silas there sitting with their feet in stocks. And by the way, these stocks are meant to be really uncomfortable. Stretch your legs apart. and It's just, it's just bad. It's just torturous. And they're already feeling terrible. They've been beaten. Who knows? Infection could be setting in. You just don't know what's going on here. But they have no expectation of a miracle. You say, what? We should always expect a miracle. That's what the guy on TV said. Well, fine. But the point is, your faith is not in a miracle. Your faith is in God. And whatever he wants to do, that's right. They knew God could deliver them any time from any situation. And we should feel that way all the time. He can deliver us any time in any way he chooses. But God has not given them any revelation regarding a divine release. They weren't singing hymns. They weren't praying out loud because they were priming the pump for a miracle they knew God had to give them. That's not what's going on. They're faithful. They just love God. They're glorifying Him in the depths of this prison. Release or no release. Now that's something. We know that God had previously delivered the apostles from prison with angelic help in Acts chapter 5. We saw that. He also rescued Peter from prison and execution in Acts 12. You say, so he has to, no, oh, you forgot Stephen and James. Both of them were martyred during the same time period. You see, faithfulness is trusting God regardless of how he chooses to use us for his glory. That's faithfulness. These faithful men continuously evangelize by praising God with public prayer and the singing of hymns. Their hearts are focused on glorifying God. Therefore, their miserable physical situation is of secondary importance. They knew that they were prisoners of Christ and not of Rome. Well, that's going to make all the difference in the world. Little did they know that their sacred music concert was about to bring down the house, literally. Paul and Silas continuously pray and sing. Every prisoner heard God being glorified. Think about the reactions of these cellmates to this praying and singing from this vermin-infested pit. And suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. Paul and Silas had prepared the soil with their prayer and praise. God now acts in power to confirm the gospel message that has been spoken, prayed, and sung by his servants. Now, as we see in Revelation, earthquakes are part of eschatological judgment, end-time judgment, but, and they cause great fear of divine justice to the unsaved. Remember, they're all crying out as the earth shook and boulders came down and axed. Oh, cover us over. We don't want to look at the face of the Lamb. Oh, you know, earthquake, everything's happening. Fearful judgment. But this earthquake is a sign of God's deliverance to the redeemed. All those things we see happening in Revelation, they are fearsome. They cause fear to unbelievers. But to Christians, they're the sign that Christ is returning. And so we rejoice. Now the earthquake is a powerful sign. The jailer responds with thoughts of suicide since he's a dead man anyway. You see, there was a Justinian code that they all had to live by. That demanded that the jailers who allowed their prisoners to escape must be executed. No excuses. Sorry, your prisoners escaped. You die. So he figured, why wait for them to come and kill me? I'll just kill myself now. 
You see, the picture of divine judgment is about to fall on this hapless jailer as he draws his sword. However, it's not judgment. It's divine deliverance that is revealed. As Paul calls out with reassurance, do not harm yourself. We're all here. Can you imagine the reaction to that guy? We just read it and go, yeah, okay. You're in this filth pit as a prisoner. You have an earthquake, and all the chains come off, and the doors are opened. Rule number one, you run. (laughs) You get out of there. Fear not. We are all here. That's a miracle. So why did the other prisoners not flee, given this opportunity for escape? Well, you see, God was at work in them, even as he was at work in the jailer. The earthquake was irrefutable evidence that God was delivering sinners from judgment. They all knew this was a mighty miracle. They'd been sitting through the concert. They knew these guys were innocent. They knew every detail that was going on here. They'd been around. They'd heard what was going on. You know, it's not like they're living in Phoenix or L.A. I mean, these communities, everybody knew everybody, and they knew everybody's business. And when they saw all this going down, they went, oh my goodness, God is here. The jailer falls before Paul and Silas. He's full of fear. He's played a part in their obvious injustice that was perpetrated upon them. He does not want to be judged guilty by a God with the power to destroy a prison, even while preserving the prisoners. So, God's tilled the soil, and now he's going to bring forth a crop. Verse 30, then he brought them out, the jailer, the jailer brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night, you know, this has got to be two morning or something, and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once. And he and all his family, boy, they were all excited. They were all getting saved. Well, why not? They realized what was going on too. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them. And he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. They were just having a good old testimony time, a party. Rejoicing. Out of God's prepared soil, salvation springs forth. The jailer, members of his household, and who knows how many of the prisoners find salvation in Jesus Christ. Whoa, wouldn't you like to have been there and watch this go down? When God is preparing the soil, a crop is guaranteed. This is seen in the impassioned heart cry of the jailer. What must I do to be saved? He had, no doubt, heard the testimony of the delivered slave girl. He personally handled Paul and Silas's unjust incarceration, and he heard their hymns of God, of God's glory in the night. God had called the jailer. It was a divine appointment. God had written his name in the Lamb's book of life before the foundation of the world. At this divine appointment, God regenerated the jailer's heart, so he believed and was converted. And when Paul told him to trust in Christ, he did. You know, Bishop John Taylor Smith, who was the honorary chaplain to Queen Victoria and the chaplain general of the British Army during World War I was considered everybody's bishop. Jovial, saintly, a favorite at Keswick conferences. He's Anglican, I would assume then. Bishop Smith used to ask all the candidates for the chaplaincy to the army. He would ask them one question. Now I want you to show me how you would deal with a man. We will suppose I am a soldier who has been wounded on the field of battle. I have three minutes to live. 
and I'm afraid to die because I do not know Christ. Tell me, how may I be saved and die with the assurance that all is well? Wow. It's quite a quiz. Now, if the chaplain who is applying for the job began to beat about the bush and talk about the true church and ordinances, you know, just religious garbled stuff, and so on, the good bishop would say, that will not do. I have only three minutes to live. Tell me what I must do. Ooh, now it's getting serious. And as long as Bishop Smith was chaplain general, unless a candidate could answer that question, he could not become a chaplain in the army. You've got to be able to preach the gospel like that. Because somebody's life may be hanging in eternity. Bishop Smith was right. A gospel that cannot save a dying man is no gospel. A gospel that initially requires more than faith alone is no gospel. The Philippian jailer was saved that night by faith. If his life extended over many months and years, he would discover you know, that the Christian life demands a lot of different things. But he would always know that his salvation came through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ alone, nothing else. What a glorious thing it is to offer salvation to all by trust in Christ plus nothing. So what follows in our story, we won't go into that, is the fruit of repentance. The jailer washes Paul and Silas's wounds, even though he has received a greater washing. He takes them into his house, even as he has been adopted into the household of God. And he feeds them, as he is now fed at the Lord's banqueting table. He does all of this while rejoicing with his family in their newfound salvation. Let's finish this off. What have we learned? What are the things that we can conclude here? Well, serving the Lord doesn't mean things will always go our way. Sorry. If I told you anything else, I'd be lying to you. Serving the Lord doesn't mean things will always go our way. But we know God is always in control and things will always go His way. He knows those who have been appointed unto salvation and He will move heaven and earth to bring them into His kingdom. He may use you to achieve this. Our expectations need to be grounded in faith and not fear. We belong to God, and He has the final word on how He wants to use us for His glory. Did you hear that? He has the final word on how He wants to use you for His glory. Like Paul and Silas, our lives should overflow with prayer and praise regardless of the circumstances. God is sovereign over the circumstances and will use them for our spiritual growth, the salvation of others, and His glorification. Finally, the gospel proclaims the truth that Faith in Christ alone is the rescue that God has provided so that we might escape the day of His wrath. Salvation is Christ plus nothing.
Let's go ahead and pray. Father, we thank you for what you've shown us here in the book of Acts. What you were doing in Philippi, Lord, there's just so much to unpack there for us as believers, called by you. You have many assignments for each of us. Father, we pray that we would not be fearful, but that we would trust in you. And that, Lord, we would understand that the gospel is about Jesus and his atoning work on the cross and nothing else. We can't add anything to it. It's complete and it's perfect. Thank you, Jesus, for taking our sins upon you. That we might be born again and members of your kingdom. And in Jesus' name they all said, Amen. Amen. You're dismissed.